Grade 11 English, Chapter 2. We are not afraid to die if we all can be together. Detailed summary. The narrator, 37 year old businessman, along with his wife Mary and her two children, Jonathan, age 6, and Susan, 7, went on a voyage on their ship in July 1976. They started from Plymouth, England. They wanted to complete the sea trip around the world, just like the one that had been completed. 200 years ago by the famous captain James Cook. The narrator and his wife spent 16 years improving their seafaring skills. They got a ship built professionally, a 23 meter long, 30 ton heavy wooden hull called Wave Walker. They took several months to test it in the roughest of weathers. The initial phase of the three-year-long journey of 1,5,000 km passed pleasantly. They sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. The narrator hired two crew, crew, two crewmen before heading towards the east to tackle the roughest sea, the southern Indian Ocean. Their names were Larry Vigil, an American, and Herb Siegler, a Swiss. On the second day in Cape Town, they encountered a strong wind, which continued for several weeks. A strong wind was not a problem, but 15 meters high waves, which were the height of the mast, worried the narrator. On December 25, they had traveled 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. They celebrated Christmas together, despite the bad weather. The weather remained the same till New Year's Day, but they hoped for it to change soon. The weather conditions worsened on the early morning of January 2. The waves were very huge. They were sailing with a small storm jib at a speed of 8 knots. When the ship was sailing with the huge waves, they could see the huge sea in front of them. The noise of the waves and the strong winds was painful for the ears. They dropped the storm jib to slow down the ship and hit a heavy mooring rope across the back part of the ship in a loop. They lashed everything with double force. They put on their oil skins and life jackets, attached lifelines and went through the life raft drill and waited. Around 6 p.m. an unpleasant silence rolled over. It was an indication of a disaster which was about to happen. The wind suddenly dropped and the sky was darker with heavy clouds. A huge cloud was coming towards the stern of the ship, but later the narrator realized it was a huge wave. The wave was perfectly vertical and it was twice the height of the previous waves they saw with the top of the wave looking unpleasant due to its height. The thunder increased and the waves waves moved with the, st uh, the thunder increased and the waves moved the stern up. They thought that it would not do any damage, but a huge explosion vibrated the deck. A strong moving stream of green and white water broke over the ship. The narrator's head smashed in the wheel of the ship. He flew overboard and, and sank below the waves. He accepted that his death was approaching and started losing consciousness. He felt quite peaceful. The narrator's head popped out of water. The ship was about to overturn, but a wave turned her upright. His lifeline jacket was stretched. He grabbed the guard rails and sailed to the ship's main pole. The waves tossed him around the neck. He was injured as his left ribs cracked. His mouth filled with blood and he had a broken tooth. He found the wheel, lined the stern for the next wave and waited. There was water everywhere. The narrator could feel water below the ship, but he didn't leave the wheel alone. Suddenly the front door opened and his wife Mary came screaming that they were sinking. She said, the decks are smashed. We are full of water. The narrator handed her the wheel and climbed towards the door. The crewmen Larry and Herb were pumping the water very fast. The timbers of the ship were broken and were hanging badly. 
the store board of the ship had sunk clothes crockery charts tins and toys were roaming around in deep water the narrator swam and prowled to the children's cabin and asked the children whether they were all right the children replied yes show sure, his daughter complained about a big bump on her head the narrator didn't pay much attention to his, to, to it as his major concern was to save them the narrator found screws hammer and canvas he went back to the deck the broken starboard side was letting so much water in if the narrator couldn't fix the problem they would all sink in the sea the narrator stretched the canvas cloth and secured the waterproof hatch which covered the gaping holes some water streamed below and some was now deflected over the side the hand pump was blocked as rubbish was floating around the cabins and entered it the electric pump short circuited as the water level rose the narrator found two hand pumps had been removed along with a rope jib and a small board and the main anchor he found another electric pump under the chart room he connected it to an out pipe and it started working the whole night was about the endless routine of pumping out of the what out the water steering the wheel and working the radio there were no replies to their signals sent or sent over the radio as they were in the a uh, remotest part of the world sue's head was now more swollen as she had two back eyes with a deep cut in her arm when upon being asked why she didn't tell him about her injuries earlier she said that she didn't want to worry him as he was trying to save all of them the water level was under control by the morning of january 3 so all of them took two hours rest in rotation but there still was a leak somewhere below the water line upon checking the boat rib structure was badly broken down till the base of the ship the whole section of starboard was held together with a few cupboards cupboard partitions the ship's condition was so bad that it would not make it till australia the narrator checked the charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few kilometers to the east one of them was isle amsterdam which was a french scientific base their only hope was to search and reach the island but only if the wind and the sea do not cause further damage else their chances were slim rare the wave had destroyed the ship's auxiliary engine after 36 hours of continuous pumping on january 4 the water was only a few centimeters left to be pumped out but they still had to pump out the water which was coming in they could not set sail on the main mast they hoisted the storm jib and the sail to as a small to small island they had their first meal in two days some corned beef and some cracker biscuits found by mary the rest period was short lived as black clouds built up around 4 pm the wind was now 40 knots and the sea was getting higher the weather get the weather got worse and by the early morning of january 5 the situation was bad When the narrator went to comfort his children his son asked him whether they were going to die he tried to assure him that they would make it his son replied that they were not afraid to die till they all were together this filled the narrator with a determination to fight back he made efforts to protect the weakened weakened starboard side he used an improvised sea anchor made of heavy nylon rope and a two 22 liter plastic barrels of kerosene that same evening the narrator and his wife sat holding hands and they believed that their end was near their end was near the ship made it through the storm and by the morning of january 6 the narrator tried to get reading on the sextant the he worked with wind speed drift and current and cal- calculated the position 
they were in 150000 kilometers area of ocean looking for a 65 kilometer wide island while the narrator was uh, still thinking his daughter shu joined him and as she was in pain the left side of her head was swollen and her blackened eyes had narrowed down the slits she gave him a card which she had made herself on the front of the card was a cartoon image of her parents with words written about them being funny people and how they made her laugh on the inside of the card she told them how she loved them both and she thanked them she made narrator realize that they had to make it to the island The narrator rechecked his calculations. They lost their main compass and were using the spare, a spare one which was not corrected for uh, magnetic variations. He estimated the influence of the westerly currents which flow through uh, the Indian Ocean. Around 2 p.m. he went on deck and asked Larry to steer the wheel to 185 degrees. He felt if they were lucky, they would see the island by 5 p.m. Then he went below the slept below and slept he woke up around 6 pm and it was dark outside he thought that they might have missed the island he started worrying about how they would tackle the westerly wind more as the ship was incapable to sail more his son came and asked him for a hug his daughter followed he asked that why he was getting a hug His son replied that he was the best daddy in the world and also called him the best captain. The narrator replied that he was afraid not this time. Uh, Sue told him then that they had found the island which was a big, which was as big as a battleship. The narrator rushed to the deck and gave a sigh of relief. They could see the complete outline of Isle Amsterdam. There was a bleak piece of volcanic rock in front of them. It had a little vegetation it was the most beautiful island in the world they moved the ship at some distance from the shore and the next morning 28 inhabitants of the amsterdam island helped them to move on the shore of the island as he felt the land again on his feet he thought of his crewmen and his wife he also thought of his 7 year old daughter who was injured badly She had to go through six minor operations to remove the blood clot in her head his son who never gave up and was not afraid to die So this is a summary of this lesson I hope you have understood this thank you